Okay, public finance. That's the topic that I've been uh, assigned to. And what public finance means is you get money for government to finance its services. That's public finance. What's my take on this? My take on this is you don't need public finance. It's a fallacy to think we need public finance. The only reason we need public finance is because the government, the public, is providing services, goods and services for us, presumably the goods and services that we're incapable of providing for ourselves through markets. But there are no such things. Anything that the government provides, uh, armies, courts, police, uh, welfare, whatever, any of it, all of it has always been provided by the free enterprise system, so you don't really need public finance. And that's about the end of my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I did that, Doug French would say, come on, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to pay you, so I've got to say something else. But that really is, is the public finance lecture, I think, from the from the libertarian point of view, from the Austrian point of view, we can say a lot more, but from the libertarian point of view, there's no need for public finance because you privatize everything. My motto is if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything and you have no public finance. The, the fallacies that I'll be now covering more as an Austrian than as a libertarian well, the main four economic, fallis, uh, economic uh, failures, that's what they call it. They call it economic failures in, in the mainstream uh, uh, press or in the mainstream uh, tradition. The biggies are monopoly, uh, unequal distribution or maldistribution of income. The third is externalities, and the fourth is public goods. I won't be discussing monopoly. It's a separate issue, and other lecturers here are doing that. I've written about it, if you're interested. Hit me up and I'll send you stuff on that. Heck, I've written about all this stuff, so if I don't answer your questions and we don't have time, just email me with a question and I will uh, try to do the best I can through email. But I will be talking about income redistribution, public goods, and externalities. But before I get into it, what is the usual um, way that the mainstream public finance people deal with things. The way they deal with it, uh, this is a very rough estimate of it, is what they do is they put um, regressive, proportional, and progressive taxes on the top, and then a whole bunch of issues, sales tax, income tax, VAT, excise, tariff, inheritance tax. Here I do it a little bit more neatly, so you can get a, a different view of that. And what they do is they, uh, some public finance courses, what they'll do is they'll take the income tax and they'll go across regressive, proportional, progressive. And then they'll take a land tax, and then they'll take an um, interest tax, and they'll compare uh, the difference in, on these three, each one at a time. So they'll take a profit tax, regressive, profit proportional, profit progressive. Other times what they'll do is they'll just take regressive. They'll say, okay, all taxes are regressive, and now let's go down the row instead of across the columns. Either way, you cover this, and I think that's a good way to approach this, uh, make boxes out of the things, like I made boxes here, and make sure the students understand what goes in each box. The way I do my environmental economics class is very similar to that. Uh, what I do is um, I uh, say, here is the free market environmentalist view, here's the moderate view, and here's the left wing view, and then we consider whole bunches of environmental issues instead of different taxes like, you know, species extinction and global warming and overpopulation and things like that. So it's a good way to give students an overview at, by being able to fill in all the boxes. So I'm, I'm sort of in support of doing it that way if you have to do it at all. I, I don't think you should have to do it at all, but that's a different issue. Uh, another issue that sometimes comes up of interest in public finance is this thing called the Laffer curve. Here is the Laffer curve, where you have revenue over here and you have the tax rate here. And when you have a tax rate of 100%, how much revenue does the government collect? Zero, because if they're going to take it all away, you're not going to produce it in the first place. On the other hand, if you have a zero tax rate, how much will the government collect? Zero because you know, they're not taxing anything at all. And somewhere in between there is the maximum revenue that the government can get. 
And what I say is if they tax it at 35%, they'll maximize their revenues. Now, I think Laffer has been unfairly convicted or charged with saying, well, the optimal tax is the tax that maximizes government revenues. He didn't really say that, although he's been accused of that. But an interesting uh, implication of this is the fact that at different points, like what is the, suppose we're at, well, let me try this one again. Suppose we're at a 75% tax rate, and we're thinking of lowering the tax rate to 70%, but we know that the government is going to get more revenue at 70% than at 75%. So should we, as libertarians, as Austrians, this question doesn't come up because Austrianism is value-free, and this is a value-laden question, should we favor a lowering of the tax? And we have a little bit of a quandary. On the one hand, we sort of favor low taxes. On the other hand, we don't favor government getting more revenue. So we have a little bit of a quandary. Um, my way of answering that one is lower taxes, because at least you're going in the right way. So if you extrapolate from that, if you keep getting to lower taxes, it's better to get to zero than to go the other way to 100. Because you could say, well, let's raise taxes from 75 to 80. That's good because the government will get res less money. <laughs> but we don't really want that. You get, the, <laughs> you get the same sort of a thing like, should we legalize drugs? Well, obviously, as libertarians, we should legalize drugs. But the point is the government will then start to tax it, and they'll get more revenue. Some people say, well, this is a reason for legalizing. But for the libertarian, it's an argument against legalizing. It's the only good argument against legalizing I've ever heard, <laughs> that the government will have more revenue, and we don't want the government to have more revenue. OK, so much for these um, um, interesting points. Now what I want to get to is the issue of public goods. What's public goods? This is one of the most serious, uh, most sophisticated arguments against the free enterprise system in favor of government. And the way that they do this, let me see if I can zoom in so I get the whole page. Yeah, that does it. OK, the, the way that they uh, do this is they say there are two issues. One is excludability. Can the government exclude? non-payers from getting it. The idea is if you can't exclude a non-payer from getting it, then the market can't work. The market can only work if, if you can exclude a non-payer, and the, the people who enjoy it have to pay, and the people that don't get it uh, you know, uh, don't have to pay, but you can exclude them. Namely, are there any free riders? If everyone's a free rider, then goes the argument, you're not going to have much success in the market. So excludability is one of the issues. The other is rivalrousness. What does rivalrousness mean? What, rivalrous, what rivalrousness means, <laughs> that was a rough one, is are people rival with regard to the thing? Namely, if I have it, does that preclude you from having it? Or can we both have it at the same time? And if we can both have it at the same time, why should we exclude? So the question is, should you exclude even if you can exclude? I don't think this is very clear, what I just said, although I think what I just said is accurate. But let me go through some examples, and hopefully that will make it more clear. Take pizza. Can you exclude people from eating pizza who don't pay for the pizza? Yes. You, uh, so we say yes to can you exclude? Yes, you can exclude people from uh, non-pizza payers from eating the pizza because you have a very credible threat. If they come up and they grab your pizza, you call the cops. And uh, the cops will stop them and put them in jail. Can you exclude 100%? No, there's pizza theft. But pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, by and large, the purveyor of pizza has a very credible threat to make against the guy who's stealing his pizza, namely, you know, cut it out, or I'll bash you, or I'll call the cops. So we can exclude. Um, can we exclude people from walking on a crowded street? Think of Times Square at um, uh, Times Square in New York City on the. Um, uh, the end of the year, December 31st, New Year's Eve, and there are millions of people, and the idea is, you know, what are you going to do? Go to this guy and say, hey, did you pay to be here? And, you know, did you pay to be here? The idea behind the neoclassicals is that it's very hard to exclude people from using a crowded street. Okay, can you, uh, so now I've explained what excludability is. Let me uh, go further. Uh, can you exclude people from using a TV program. Yes, you can. What you do is you broadcast the TV program, and then you, uh, um, what do you call it, interfere with the uh, 
the TB program, but you sell people a box, uh, an unscrambling box that will, un that will enable them to see the thing. Whereas if you don't buy this box, then you can't see the, the TV program. So I'm broadcasting the TV program. The people on this side of the aisle have all got a box that will unscramble it. So you guys pay me, and I'll give you the box. You can see it. You guys, you dirty rats, don't pay me, so I can exclude you by not giving you the box. Uh, what about uh, the fence in the lighthouse? The idea here is that if we make a credible threat to the commies, or whoever the bad guys do or are, that if you mess with us, we'll nuke you. We'll throw, a, a, we'll throw one in the men's room in the Kremlin. Well, and, and I'm trying to protect the people on this side of the aisle, let's say the east of the Mississippi. The people on the west of the Mississippi will also uh, benefit from this threat to the Russians. Namely, I can't exclude you guys from the benefit of it, because I'm protecting these guys. So you guys are free riders. And since you're free riders, these guys will say, well, if they're not paying, we shouldn't pay, so defense can't be privatized. Or the lighthouse, which would be another example. Can you exclude? Well, no. I mean, if I put the lighthouse on it, and you guys pay me to put the lighthouse on, uh, because I put the lighthouse on a rock, and, and if your boat hits the rock, it's kablooey for you. But these guys have got boats, and they're not paying, so I can't exclude them. If I put the light on, that's it. OK, so that's so much for excludability. Now let's talk a little bit about rivalrousness. Are we rival for pizza? Yes, we're very rival for pizza. If I'm eating it, you can't eat it. If I'm wearing this wristwatch, you can't wear this wristwatch. Uh, but what about um, TV? Is TV rivalrous? No, TV is not rivalrous. If I'm broadcasting out the TV thing, um, you're not rival. Any, any number of people can access it. So even though I can exclude, I shouldn't exclude according to this because we want to uh, promote efficiency. And uh, um, defense and lighthouse are not rivalrousness either because you can all enjoy the defense or the, the lighthouse. OK, now don't get the idea that one quarter of all goods are in each of the four boxes. Maybe for the left-wing neoclassicals, that's true. But for the Chicago school, which is supposedly free enterprise, they would say, well, most goods are right here. So most goods can be privatized. And there are very few exceptions where we have to have the government involved. The people at Berkeley or Harvard would say, well, there are more things like that. And the Marxists would say, everything is like that. So you get a, a variance in, in how much we can have privatized. OK, I've now explained the public goods argument. I think I've explained it to the satisfaction of a neoclassical person. Uh, so if a neoclassical person were to hear this, they'd say, well, you know, you don't have it perfectly. You didn't really um, put enough body English in supporting this. You could have done a better job. But by and large, I think if they were fair, they'd say, yeah, that's, that's what the public goods argument is. What I'm now going to do is to try to undermine this and say why it, this so-called market failure is a fallacy, and that the market is legitimate and is able to overcome the public goods argument. OK, the first thing I'll do is I'll attack excludability. Just because the government can't exclude people from a crowded street doesn't mean that private people can't exclude people from the crowded street. You don't have to go over to each individual. What you could do is give everybody a little tag like this. And here, in case you can't see it, uh, give them a little tag like that. And then you, the police look around. And anyone without that tag, they say, sir, do you have your tag maybe in your pocket? Uh, if not, they grab you. And that's a credible threat. Look, the Mises Institute, part of the reason that they're doing this is to exclude people. Uh, we go out into the uh, uh, have dinner or lunch or whatever it is. And uh, they can't check everyone. We don't know everyone. There are 260 students here and, and maybe 40 staff and faculty. It's a 300 people. That's not a crowded city street, but it's pretty crowded. And this is one way of excluding. So just because the government can't exclude, the market can. Uh, defense, we, we can exclude. What we can do is say, OK, in Taxachusetts, there are a bunch of wimps and sissies, and you know, they're not going to pay for defense. But in Texas, they sure as hell are, because you know, Texans are macho. And, and we can tell the Russians, or the Martians, or whoever the bad guy is, 
you know, you want to bomb uh, Massachusetts? We're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna retaliate. But you mess with Texas, and you know, your your rear end is grass or whatever the expression is. We're gonna we're gonna come get you. So you can exclude. Perfectly? No, you can't. Nothing is perfect, but you can make a credible exclusion. Uh, even on a domestic level, the, if you don't have this tag, uh, and, and it could be on your house, it could be on your store, it could be on your car. Uh, this one says the Acme Defense Agency will defend you, your person, and your property. And if you don't have that, that's a, an open sesame, almost. Namely, if we attack the guy without the tag, uh, if a criminal attacks a person without the tag, the police will not stop him. So, the, the, you know, this would be an incentive for people not to free ride, but to subscribe to the uh, police services. Bill Barnett and I have several articles out on the lighthouse. The lighthouse is a real big uh, issue among economists. And what we say, is, to shorten it very much, again, if you're interested in more, uh, hit me up and I'll send you our lighthouse literature. We can make a credible threat to the non-payers. You guys have boats and you haven't paid for my lighthouse. You guys have. And the threat I can make as the lighthouse owner is I can say, look, most of the time you're right. You can get away with not paying and you'll see the lighthouse and you'll be protected from uh, crashing onto the uh, shore. However, one of these days, and this is in the days of sailboats when lighthouses meant something. Now we have GPS. It doesn't matter. But the economic theory should be timeless. Namely, economics should show that markets are legitimate, whatever the technology. I can say, you know, one of these days, the moon is going to sort of be out there, and the, and the clouds are not going to be covering, and I'm going to be able to recognize your boats. And if there are any of their boats out there, you're safe. But one of these days, they will only be your boats, and I'm going to shut the lighthouse down. And then you're going to have risk of crashing. And I'm going to broadcast this, and every sailor you hire on your boat is going to know that he is engaged in a dangerous activity, and you're going to have to pay him more salary a whole year, even though it might only be once or twice a year. So this is a way of excluding non-payers. Is it perfect? No. But it's a way of excluding non-payers. Coase got this all wrong. Our article is mainly an attack on Coase. I'm not a big fan of Coase, and I've got a lot more to say about Coase, which I'll say further when we get to externalities. Um, it's the, it, it, it's um, very similar. So th this is called a pure public good. These are semi, demi public goods. Um, the idea here is that it costs something. The marginal cost is greater than zero of providing it. Here, the marginal cost is zero of adding one more person. Given that I've got a lighthouse, one more person watching it doesn't matter. Given I've got a TV program, one more person doesn't matter. Right? But I can say that even as a, an attempted reductio, even uh, the pizza has got a zero cost. Because once I produce it, it's costless. So maybe the government should produce that too. So if you accept this argument, what you're really forced to I think, with the reductio ad absurdum, is that everything should be run by the government. And that's not what these guys want. What these guys want is only certain things should be run by uh, government, not everything. They're not totally against markets. OK, that's sort of an overview of the public goods argument. Let me now move to a thing called externalities. What's going on with externalities? Get my notes out on that. Here we go. OK, what's going on with externalities? There are two types of externalities. There's external economies and external diseconomies, sometimes called positive externalities, sometimes called negative externalities. But whichever way you zig or zag, it's a market failure according to the critics of the market. Here is an external economy or a positive externality. And the idea here is that this is the ordinary demand curve, and that's the ordinary supply curve. And this is the actual amount of a good that you will purchase, which has an external economy. What is an external economy? An external economy is there are positive spillover benefits of me doing something, and you benefit. For example, I take a shower once a month, whether I need it or not. And the people in the front row are benefiting from this, because otherwise you know, you'd be in trouble. So, and yet, I can't charge you for it. You benefit, and I can't charge you for it. So there'll be uh, too little of it. 
Let me give you another example, education. This is the demand curve for education. This is the supply curve of education. And I'm going to get this much education, that actual amount of education. Why am I going to get the actual amount of education? Because I can get a better job, or I'll be more attractive to friends, I'll be able to influence people, whatever the reason. But there are external benefits. And when we take account of these external benefits, this is the, the true demand curve. And uh, with regard to soap, this is how much soap we're actually using because we only take into account our personal use for soap. But if we took into account the spillover benefits for others when we use soap, we get a higher demand curve. <coughs> well, similarly, there are external benefits of education, so-called. If I'm educated, I'll be less likely to be a criminal. I'm more likely to vote better, to vote more, uh, more rationally, what have you. And, and, and yet I don't get that much education because I'm only concerned with my own narrow self-interest. And my own narrow self-interest says, get this much education. Because I don't take into account the value of the extra education that I could get that would help you. You know, the hell with you. I'm in it just for myself. So I get too little education, and you get too little education, and as a society, we get too little education. And this is a sort of semi-sophisticated argument for why the government should subsidize education. Because the market is misallocating resources. The market is having too few resources in education. OK, uh, that's the argument. It's a pretty sophisticated argument. If you haven't heard it, the, um, the opposition to it isn't readily apparent, but that's what I'm going to give you now. First of all, the you know where rent control and minimum wage law are the most popular? They're most popular in college towns, <laughs> like the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, the People's Republic of Cambridge, Mass., the People's Republic of, I don't know, uh, where is it in Texas? Um, Austin, Texas, big college town. And let's stipulate that rent control and minimum wage are bad things. So the very opposite is true. What we ought to do is tax education here. It's an external diseconomy, which I'll get to in a minute. Namely, we've got too much education. The people who are the most educated are the, the most uh, idiotic. They're the ones who are voting for these bad things. So that, that's one argument against that. Uh, the a more sophisticated argument against this is that, that you have no way of measuring any of this stuff. This is just, uh, 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 what do you call it, lines on a blackboard or lines on a screen. You can't prove anything like this. Murray Rothbard has a beautiful quote. See, what we're trying to do is force other people to become more educated. And Murray says, quote, A and B often benefited is held if they can force C into doing something. Any argument proclaiming the right and goodness of, say, three neighbors who yearn to form a string quartet, forcing a fourth neighbor at bayonet point to learn to play the viola, is hardly deserving of sober comment. And yet, th that's what this is. There are two people saying, you know, you're not educated enough. You're not educated. You should be more educated to benefit me. So we're going to force you at bayonet point. Or as um, uh, my buddy, uh, my opponent uh, last night um, was saying, that the men with a badge and a gun are going to come at you and make you become more educated. Well, you know, that's not kosher. So what Murray is saying, this is not really worthy of sober comment. Uh, to force people into... Uh, doing things because supposedly there'll be spillover benefits for other people. It's just silly. There's no way to prove this. Okay, let's move from external economies or positive externalities to uh, negative externalities. Oh, wait, there's more to be said on this. Um, one of the reasons for, for public parks, we can have private parks because if we have private parks, uh, there'll be a misallocation of resources. Again, this is sort of a sophisticated argument, and this is what they teach you in economics, God help us. See, if you have a public park, and, and it'll have spillover benefits, the value of the houses across the street will increase. Isn't that true? Yes, that's probably true. If right now there's a big slum, say uh, Harlem, and, and what I do is I take a square block, and I'm going to knock down all the houses and put in a park, and there'll be green space, and it'll be nice, and it'll increase the value of the other houses, Right? There'll be an underinvestment of, of private parks. Why? Because the owner of the private park can't capture the value of the houses all around the park. 
and therefore there'll be fewer parks than would be optimal, and the government knows how many parks are optimal. You know, we, we stipulate this, obviously. They're the governments, they must know. And therefore, uh, since there are external economies or spillover benefits, there'll be too few parks or maybe no parks at all, and therefore the government has to do it. The obvious refutation of this is that if I'm the only one, I'm setting up a private park, I'm the only one who knows that where I'm going to set it up, and what I could do if I think that the value of these houses will increase, I'll buy up the, those houses too. You get it? Before I put in the park, I'll buy up all the houses around the park, then I'll put in the park, and then I'll capture the value of this. Will I capture it all? No. Perfection is denied us on this side of the Garden of Eden. But I'll capture some of it or a lot of it because only I know where it will be, right? And I'll start buying this land surreptitiously under friends' names, right? So that nobody gets wind of the idea that I'll buy this park. Okay, so that's the argument on parks and that's the reputation. Now let me get into external diseconomies. What's an external diseconomy? The usual uh, definition of an external diseconomy or a negative externality is something not where I benefit you and I can't charge you for it, but rather where I harm you and you can't charge me for the harm I impose on you. And I said that too quickly, so and I'm not going to say it again, but let me give an illustration of it, pollution. What I do is I create these podiums and most of the costs, here is the supply curve, which is the cost curve, most of the uh, actual Costs, there's supply and demand, that's the actual number of podiums I make. Most of these costs are so-called internalized. I have to pay for the wood. If I don't pay for the wood, I don't get the wood, I go to jail. If I steal the wood, I have to pay for the labor, I have to pay for uh, the interest rate on my loan, I have to pay for the factory. I have to pay for all these things. But there's one external cost that I don't have to pay for, and that is the pollution that I waft out onto your land and your lungs and your washing and stuff like that. And I don't have to pay for that. And if I did have to pay for that, the supply curve would shift upward, and that would take into account total costs. See, the argument for external economies is I'm not taking into account total benefits. Here, the argument is I'm not, I, uh, that is the free market, I'm not taking into account total costs. And when we take into account total cost, the optimal amount of these things is here, not here. Namely, I'm overproducing things because I'm not taking into account part of the costs that I'm on imposing on other people. And you can't sue me for it. Everyone get that? Okay. That's the argument for externalities, uh, the negative externalities. Uh, pollution, the market misallocates resources by having too much. Before it was too little. What is the libertarian or rather Austrian refutation of this so-called market failure? We don't say it's not a failure. Pollution is a failure, but it's not a market failure. It's a government failure. Now here, Murray Rothbard's article, Air Pollution, I forget the, the total title of it. It's a big, long title, but the key word is air pollution. It's a magnificent article. It must be 90 pages. Uh, it's available for free at the Mises Institute. The first half has got nothing to do with pollution or anything. It's just the law of property rights. And then in the second half, he applies it to, to this sort of a thing. And what Murray says, and he gets a lot of this from a guy named Horowitz, not Steve Horowitz, the, the semi-Austrian, but the uh, historian at Harvard University. And what he says is in the 1830s, when, when we had a quasi-libertarian law, there was a spate of nuisance suits and uh, what would happen is uh, some little old lady would hang up her washing on the line. This is before uh, dryers. She would hang it up and it would be clean and wet. And then she'd come back two hours later and it would be dry but dirty. And she'd go to court and say, that there factory, you can see it's spuming forth pollutants and some of the pollutants are coming here and are getting onto my laundry. I want two things. I want a, an injunction, and that is a, an order from the court to tell them to cut it out, and I want damages. And pretty much in the 1830s and 1840s, this was agreed to by the courts. In other words, the philosophy of the courts was that if you're going to damage other people, physically invade them, you're going to get an injunction to make you stop it, and if you don't respect the injunction, we put you in jail, and we're going to make you pay damages for it, and as a result, 
you didn't have too much of this. Or you had a case of a farmer put out his haystack and the, the railroad comes by with sparks going 400 feet and the sparks set off the uh, haystack and the farmer goes to court and says, hey, uh, you know, the, tell the railroad to cut it out and give me damages. And if you could prove this, the burden of proof was on you, the courts would pretty much accede to this. And as a result, things were pretty good. Uh, from an environmental point of view. This is, I'm now giving you sort of a free market environmentalist analysis of pollution. Things were pretty good. Uh, the, uh, the factories were led as if by Adam Smith's invisible hand to use clean burning anthracite coal, even though it was a little bit more expensive, rather than dirty burning sulfur coal, because the dirty burning sulfur coal would get on the little old ladies uh, washing. And the railroad was led by an invisible hand to get uh, spark prevention devices. So they put some sort of fence there so the sparks didn't fly so much. And things were pretty good. There was even a bit of environmental forensics. You know what forensics is from the CSI movies, you know, the blood and the semen and the hair follicles to see who murdered and who raped. Well, you take a little dust bit and you would have to ana analyze that and find out where it came from and then go get the, the perpetrator. So things were pretty good. Then in the 1890s, uh, 1880s, 1900s, the so-called progressive period, Kolko, Gabriel Kolko is a very good historian on this. There's an interesting story about him. He was a Marxist, but he was very good on property rights. Don't ask. And, and, and libertarians would invite him to their conferences, and he'd come because he was paid. But then he realized that we were using him to promote freedom. And he said, oh, we can't have that. And he, he refused to have anything to do with us. But we still have his books, and his books are excellent. Gabriel Kolko, K-O-L-K-O, -L -L, the progressive period. And what happened then, uh, a sea change took place over the law courts. And who was number one then? Who was the big imperial power? It was Great Britain in 1890, 1900, 1910. And we wanted to be number one. And how do you get to be number one? By, by messing with factories and taking the side of little old ladies or by, messing, by supporting stupid farmers against railroads? No. So the next time the little old lady or the uh, farmer came in a court, the, the court would say, yes, yes, they're violating your property rights. You're stinking lousy private property rights. There's something more important than private property rights, and that is a public good. And what does the public good consist of? It consists of letting these guys run rampant. And, and pollute. They did offer a SOP. They had minimum smokestack height regulations. Previously, the smokestack was 20 feet high, and you could tell where the, the stuff was coming from. Now they were 300 feet high, and, and you just had pollution all over, and it was very hard to tell where it came from. So if you were a, a green businessman, if you said, I'll use anthracite coal because it's less invasive, and, and I'll use a smoke prevention device, and I'll put stuff in my chimney to capture most of the pollutants before they get out, you would be at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis your uh, competitors who had no such compunctions. So of course, we, instead of putting the, the problem under the rug, we put it into the clouds. And of course, there was failure. But it wasn't market failure. It was government failure. It was the government's failure to uphold the law. This is the, the Murray Rothbardian analysis of that. OK, now we get to our man, Coase. And our, boo. <laughs> And our man, Coase, uh, says, you know, well, there were two other uh, solutions to this. One was, um, what the hell is his name? I think it began, Pagu. Pagu said, well, let's just have a pollution tax, which is now taken up by our friends on the environmental left. You know, the watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. Uh, I mean, there are certain people that love to run the lives of other people. And for a while, they were doing well with communism. I mean, communism was good. You could control other people's lives. And then in 1880, uh, 1989 and 91, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, and you really couldn't ride that horse anymore. So we had to come up with some other way to hitch our interventionist wagon, environmentalism. So they're really red on the inside. They just have a green cover. OK, so Pagu said, let's tax. And what Coase said is you don't really need uh, Pagovian taxes. What you could do is uh, they could negotiate. And let me just give you a little bit of Coase. I don't have time to do a, I can go on for hours about Coase. But let me give you uh, one of the favorite, uh, most famous Coasean analyses. Uh, there's a mechanic. And he lives in this house. 
And he starts, I put a number one for the mechanic because he sets up a machine that uh, makes noise. And here's a doctor who comes in and puts his uh, operating room or whatever it is, a uh, room where he uh, interviews customers, patients, and he needs quiet for a stethoscope. And everything is fine because the noise doesn't reach him. Then what happens is that the doctor moves from area two to area three. Everyone following what I'm saying? The mechanic was there first. The doctor used to be here, but then the doctor moved to the other side of his house, and he put his waiting room there, or rather his examination room there. And now he goes to court and he says, hey, the mechanic is uh, messing with me, and uh, get the mechanic to move over here, or get the mechanic to shut up. I don't care. Just get the mechanic to stop. And uh, Coase's idea uh, for pollution is that different people will negotiate. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, what Coase is saying is that we can negotiate over, uh, over pollution in an ideal world, in a, a world where there is zero transactions costs. And in a world where there is zero transactions costs, well, who, sh who should win this? Who should win this dispute? Should the mechanic win the dispute or should the the doctor win the, uh, the dispute. The libertarian answer based on homesteading and first come, first served is the mechanic wins. Why does the mechanic win? Because he was there first and he homesteaded the noise rights. <coughs> What's Kosa's answer? Kosa's answer is unclear. Kosa's answer is not that the mechanic should win or that the doctor should win. Rather, Kosa's answer is whoever should win is the guy who, if we voted against him in the court, would suffer the least damages in costs. So if the cheapest way to deal with this is to get the doctor to move back, then we vote in favor of the mechanic. And we make the doctor move back because it's cheaper to have the doctor move back. And for Coase, the key is reduce costs. On the other hand, if it's easier to shut down the mechanic or, easier to, or cheaper to put the mechanic over here away so the doctor is protected, then we go that way. So for Coase, you see, for the usual analysis, the usual pre cosian analysis is that there's cause and effect. I'm the perpetrator, I punch you in the mouth. I'm the uh, aggressor, you're the victim, that's it. For Coase, well, your chin got in the way of my fist. Uh, Coase has got this reciprocality. It, it, it's not that I punched you in the mouth, it's that you charged my fist. <laughs> and And... Who should stop? Should you stop putting your chin in the way of my fist, or should I stop putting my fist in the way of your chin is whichever is cheaper. <laughs> if it's cheaper to stop me, then you stop me. If it's cheaper to stop you, then you stop you, which is not exactly libertarian. And it's open to all sorts of uh, uh, reductios. For example, we're now having a dispute as to who owns this wallet. I, I, let's say I just, I, I just took this wallet uh, from Dr. Prince. And it's got his picture in it, and it's got a picture of his wife and his kids and all that. And, um, and now he holds me in the court, and we get a Kosian judge. And the Kosian, you see, the ordinary judge would look in the past. They'd look in history and say, well, where did you get this block? And I said, oh, I took it out of his wallet. I, I, I took it out of his pocket. I'm a great pickpocket. I'm honest. You know, I'm an honest thief, but I'm not lying. It's got, remember, it's got his picture, a picture of his wife and kids and all sorts of stuff that he has in his wallet. And I don't lie, so I just took it out of his wallet. And, um, and uh, the, the, the ordinary judge would say, well, you know, you know, give me a break. You're going to jail. You're a thief. Not the Kosian judge. The Kosian judge doesn't look in the past. The Kosian judge looks in the future. And he asks, well, he says, Block, well, what will you do with the money in the wallet? I said, I'll write great uh, uh, philosophy, and I'll write great articles, and I'll promote liberty, or I'll promote Kosianism, or something like that. <laughs> and, 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 and then he asks uh, Dr. Prince, well, what will you do? And he, he's a drunkard, and he'll just go out and get drunk uh, <laughs> with the money, and, and he'll be a burden on society, and uh, Kos will give me the wallet. <laughs> I mean... And I have all sorts of uh, great reductios. Remember uh, O.J. Simpson was supposedly killed his wife? And most people took the view, well, if, uh, if he did it, he should go to jail. And if he didn't do it, he should be free. And thanks to Kosianism, I had a third alternative. He did it, but he should have done it. Because in a zero transactions cost world, he would have bid her away from herself because he valued her more than she valued herself. She had low self-esteem. 
I mean, you, you can do anything. <laughs> you can do anything with Coasianism. See, Coase is even worse than the commies. At least the commies, <laughs> at least the commies had a theory of property rights. The bourgeois, no. The proletariat, yes. Okay, it's a theory of property rights. I mean, it's not a great theory, but it's a theory of property rights. Whereas for Coase, there's no theory of property rights. Property goes to whoever can use it best in the future. Now, how the hell does a judge know who's going to use it best? Or how the hell does Coase know who would have bid for uh, uh, O.J. Simpson's wife? I mean, it's just crazy. And yet, Coaseanism has taken over the, the whole economics profession. I mean, Coase is beloved maybe even more than most other Nobel Prize winners. I mean, he's just a horrible person. By the way... <laughs> By the way, you know who's really good on Coase? Um, uh, Gary North, magnificent. Uh, Gary North and I have been writing a lot. Other people have written good stuff on him. Uh, Gary North is excellent on Coase. He really uh, gives it to him good. OK, so this is the, uh, you get the same problem with the airport. The airport has noise. If the airport is there first, then, and, and this house comes to the nuisance, the so-called nuisance, well, the airport homesteaded the noise, and the guy who builds a house afterward has to tolerate the noise. On the other hand, if he was there first, then according to libertarian theory, the airport has to buy the noise rights from him. And you get the same sort of a thing with the pig farm, you know, who's there first, the smell, the house, whatever. Uh, there are all sorts of legal examples and legal cases like that. Okay, I've now done the second thing. Uh, first was public goods, now was um, externalities. Now I'm going to do the third thing, and this is um, another fallacy of public finance. And this is uh, the business of another market failure. Here the market failure is misallocation of resources, not really misallocation of resources, misallocation of wealth. Some people are too rich and some people are too poor. And what we have to do is have egalitarianism. We have to take money from the rich and give it to the poor. Now, for the ordinary guy in the street, and certainly for the libertarian, this sounds like theft. But no, 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 you're not sophisticated in economics. When you become sophisticated in economics, you'll understand the, the power of this stupid argument. I mean, the power of this great argument. OK, so how do we do it? Well, the first we do utils. There we go. OK, so we have utils here, and we have wealth here, and we have margin utility. Now, someone was asking me before about, you know, suppose the third beer tastes better, because you know the first beer, you drink it, and you hardly feel it. And then the second one, you sort of awake to the wonders of beer, and you enjoy it a little bit more. And then the third one is really good, and after that, you get diminishing returns. That's a psychological analysis of margin utility. And the mainstream agrees with that, so they might have a little curly cue over here. Um, let me get one out here. Like th they might say it's really uh, like this. So they, they would say minimum uh, marginal utility can rise, but then it falls. Eventually, uh, you have diminishing returns in marginal utility. Well, this is a problem. To put utils on an axis means that there are units of happiness. And there are no units of happiness. I can't say, well, right now I'm 5.3 units happy. And, um, and yesterday I was 10.6 units happy, so I'm half as happy now as I was before. I mean, you know, that, that's crazy. And yet that's what this implies. So that's one of the problems with that. But before the problems, that was just one of the problems, let's see how the mainstream economists use this sort of stuff in order to justify uh, taking money from the rich and giving to the poor. OK, so here you have a rich guy, and he earns 100000 a year. And what you're going to do is take $1,000 away from him, pushing him toward 99000 Whereas here is a poor guy who only earns 7000 a year, and you're going to give him that 1000 that you took from the rich guy. Everyone with me here? So you're reducing him from 100000 to 99000 You're increasing him from 7 to 8 And look at the benefit. The benefit is he loses the area under this curve, because that's what the margin utility curve is. It, it shows how much utility you get from $1,000. And look at how much this guy benefits. He benefits much more. And the additional benefit is in this blue striped area. 
So you see the misallocation? When one guy's got too much money and the other guy's got too little money, if you take a little bit from the rich guy and give it to the poor guy, the poor guy gains more than the rich guy loses. The rich guy loses this much, the poor guy gains that much. Right? So now what you have is not only utils, but now you have a thing, a really sick, disgusting, perverse thing called, in, what the hell is it called? ICU. Individual comparison. Interpersonal. Thanks, I'm losing my mind here. Interper Thanks, <laughs> I need all the help. Interpersonal comparisons of utility. So now what I'm saying is I'm 10.6 units happy. Uh, Tom Woods is only uh, 3.2 units happy, and therefore I'm three times happier than him. You know, th that's crazy. You, you can't say that. There are no units of happiness. And when you compare utils from one person to another, it's, it's even crazier. It, it's sort of like uh, craziness squared or something. OK, so what I'm now going to do is criticize this. And my first criticism of it will be within the scope of neoclassical economics. And what I'll say is, OK, Let's use your own tools of analysis, and let's see if we can't use them against you. Why do they both have to be on the same utility curve? Why couldn't they be on different utility curves? So I have the same utils, and I have the same interpersonal comparisons of utility, but the rich guy is on this higher utility curve because he's rich, he really enjoys things much more. For any given amount of money, the rich guy enjoys it more than the poor guy. It's just as coherent as their curve. Their assumption was they're both on the same curve. Well, I'm, I'm a good neoclassical economist. I can make two curves. I'm even more sophisticated. And, <laughs> and when I do, we get a very different result. The different result now is if you take 1,000 away from the rich guy and give it to the poor guy, well, you're taking more utils away from, from the rich guy than you're giving to the poor guy. You see that? So even using their own tools of analysis, their own idiotic uh, perspective, you can now prove the opposite. You can say, well, what we should do is take money away from the poor guy and give it to the rich guy, because you'd be taking fewer utils from him and giving more utils to the rich guy. So what we ought to do is have uh, the reverse of income distribution from rich to poor have income distribution from poor to rich. I mean, Dr. Prince is a slob, and you know, he doesn't really enjoy things. He's drunk all the time. I hope you don't mind me doing this. And uh, you know, if I take 1,000 bucks from him, he'll just, you know, he doesn't really enjoy the slobber that he uh, drinks. Whereas I'm a connoisseur. I'll drink fine wine and stuff, or I'll do much better things with him. And, and he's poor, and I'm rich, and he should give me his money. I mean, you can prove anything you damn well want with, with this nonsense. <laughs> okay, now let's, let's apply this to some real-world cases. One real-world case is uh, the case of ruining the black family with welfare. Before I do this, I want to... Uh, impress you with my sophistication as a biologist, and it goes as follows. If you put a frog in cold water and you heat it up very slowly, the, the frog's metabolism is such that it can't distinguish between fine gradations of temperature, and it stays in the boiling water, eventually hotter and hotter and boiling, and it dies. On the other hand, if you throw a frog in the boiling water, its metabolism is such that it knows darn well it's not good for it to be in the boiling water, and it hops right out. Slavery was like boiling water for the frog. Slavery did not destroy the black family. Oh yes, slavery destroyed the black family during slavery. You know, this person was sold here, that person was sold there. But after slavery, during the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, you get letters in newspapers. Mary Jones was in the ABC uh, uh, plantation and looking for Hiram Jones, her husband, who was shipped off somewhere I know not where. where. Where the hell are you? And the people would get back together. I looked at the 1910 census, 
And in the 19th century census, the black and the white families were almost as intact. The white families were about a percent or two more intact than the black families. Uh, intact means non-divorced and, and, and married, at least married, uh, uh, you start a family by being married. So slavery was, was like boiling water. It was unable to stop the black family from being a black family. And, and a family is very important. If you have two people, a mother and a father, the kids do much better. They're less likely to be criminals. They're less likely to drop out of school. They're less likely to do all sorts of incidents of bad things, uh, be killed, be in a gang, what have you. And, and all the lefties would agree to that. They would say that the intact family is a much better way for kids. And if you look at poverty, most poverty is non-intact families. If you look at the intact black families, they're not poor, with some exceptions. But in the main, they're not poor. So if you want to cure black poverty, get the black family together. OK, the next story is uh, our man uh, Johnson. Uh, uh, LBJ, Lynn Baines Johnson, started in the welfare in um, 1980. By the way, I'm getting this stuff now from Charles Murray, Losing Ground, an excellent book. And what Charles Murray shows is that the welfare was making a young black pregnant woman a much better financial offer than the uh, father of her child, say a young black man, could make off of a minimum wage job. And the only way you could collect this welfare, which was very serious money, uh, they would give you money, they'd give you an apartment, they'd give you all sorts of benefits that you couldn't get if you weren't on welfare. The only way you could get that is if there were no man in the house. Now, previously in the 1950s, for every family, black families included, if a single black female or if a single female got pregnant, it was a disgrace. She had to go live off with Aunt Tilly until she had the baby and the baby was adopted. And then maybe she could come back into society, but it was a, a, an absolute disgrace. But now, with the advent of welfare, we're throwing so much money at poor people, and it's not just blacks, it's the same thing in Sweden where they're mostly white. When you throw money at people, supply curves slope upward, and the more money you offer for something, the more response you'll get. And what they were offering was a lot of money for being pregnant without uh, an intact family, because if you had an intact family, you couldn't qualify for the welfare. So what this did is it didn't ruin the black family, the ruination of the black family will be divorce. It stopped the black family from forming in the first place. And that's one of the big incidences of, of uh, poverty, because the black family is failing to for, uh, form. In many places, 75% uh, uh, of black kids are born uh, illegitimate. Now, look, I'm not trying to make a moral case. I'm not saying it's immoral to uh, engage in intercourse. That's a very different issue. It's certainly not a libertarian issue, and it's not an Austrian issue. But what I'm saying is a matter of social uh, policy, if you really hate the black family or if you really hate black people, then you you favor welfare. I just found out, by the way, that today the NAACP uh, favored uh, legalizing drugs. I just saw it on the blog before I came over here, which is magnificent because the, well, the, because the uh, drug policy is really an attack on young black men, just as uh, the prohibition of alcohol was an attack on young Italian men during the uh, uh, alcohol prohibition times. But this is a long time coming, and they weren't even very clear. So the black leadership is, uh, is problematic. They don't see the problem of welfare. They don't see the problem of um, uh, drug addiction, uh, drug legalization, rather, uh, drug prohibition. But at least they're moving in the, in the right direction on the uh, drug issue. So one of the problems, I mean, when we, when we make fun of utils and, and we put a thing like this over here, it, it's sort of funny, you know, and, and we show that uh, the thing doesn't really work. And, but this has real world implications. And one of the real world implications is that the, the high crime rates in the inner cities uh, are a result of, of this sort of a policy of redistributing money from rich to poor. And you give it to the poor people who are disproportionately black and you undermine their family. And it doesn't say this on any of these diagrams, so I have to fill in the story. Let me give you another story about income distribution. Uh, the other one comes from Jane Jacobs, and it's got to do with public housing. Uh, there were two boxers in one of the um, uh, Olympics. 
I don't have their names here. Does anyone remember them? They were in the Pruitt Igo housing. Michael and somebody else. Spinks, the, the Spinks brothers. Uh, they lived in the Pruitt Igo houses, which was a uh, housing project in St. Louis. Uh, they must have had 50 or 60 houses, and they were all 40 or 50 stories high. And terrorists had to blow them up, but these terrorists were government terrorists. What happened is that they were vertical slums. Uh, it was just impossible to live there. Jane Jacobs has two arguments against public housing. The first argument is that in order to uh, qualify for public housing, you have to have below a certain amount of income. If you have above that income, you don't qualify. And if you qualify by being below, and then you get a, a raise above, they kick you out. So what happens in public housing is that you have single family female-headed households. And the women were unable to deal with the teenage boys. The teenage, you know that, that movie, um, the one with the 12-year-olds where they were on this island and killing each other? What's that movie? Lord of the Flies. Well, this is sort of a Lord of the Flies, not for 12-year-olds, but for 16-year-olds. And they were running rampant, the, 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 the defecating in the uh, hallways. The, the elevators were dangerous to go in. It was just a horrible thing. And the government had to uh, just blow them up because they were just uh, impossible to live there. You know, the lesson they learned from that, of course, was nothing to do with income levels, but the fact that they were high-rise buildings. So now you have low-rise public housing <laughs> with the same problems. Uh, the, the other problem that uh, Jane Jacobs saw with public housing was uh, the, the people who uh, promulgated public housing had this uh, hatred of commerce. Most high-rise buildings, at the bottom floor, you have a store. And then there's movement in and out of the store. And, and then you have what Jane Jacobs called eyes on the street. Yentas, old Jewish ladies, or old ladies, or people looking down and, and seeing who's doing what with whom, and then they call the police if something bad is happening. Well, you don't have that in public housing because there's no movement in and out, and the basketball court is a quarter of a mile away, and uh, this is a disaster for public housing. And um, the, the solution, I suppose, is to get rid of housing, uh, public housing, and get uh, tenement housing, the sort of housing that they had before. Before public housing, they had tenement housing. Yes, it wasn't that good, but it was better than the public housing because you had a landlord who had an incentive to make sure that the place was semi-safe, otherwise people wouldn't rent there. So you have this privatization or uh, non-privatization of housing, and, and this uh, is sort of like a double whammy for the black community. On the one hand, the welfare, the family, the public housing, it's uh, the, the drugs. So this is sort of... Uh, libertarian analysis of how to deal with inner city problems. And the, the solution is not governmental. It's, it's um, private. So it, it's a way of enriching this sort of analysis to show that it's not just a loss of utils, but rather there are real flesh and blood and tears problems involved with uh, redistribution of money from rich to poor. And with those remarks, I thank you for your attention.